Welcome back to another edition of the Throws Doc Podcast. I'm your doc, Dr. Charles Ferrer. We're writing scripts to cure your throwing ailments. And uh, probably after this weekend, well, let's start here. Today's uh, Monday, March uh, 20, goodness, it's 27th. It's about uh, 7 o'clock. We're just getting to school here. And uh, I'm sure everybody has some uh, NCAA brackets, ailments, they need cured. Uh, just looking at the numbers yesterday, I don't recall if um, ESPN or any of the other media outlets shared that any person correctly picked all four uh, Final Four teams uh, when the original tournament, when the bracket was released. I know uh, when they did our uh, they released the um, Sweet 16 bracket. Um, some did a little better than others. I did not. I actually lost all the Sweet 16 games. Uh, my kids, uh, three boys, each have two teams in the Final Four. Uh, so that's not bad. But from the initial, I don't know if ESPN or anybody really shared if, if anybody has a perfect bracket. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about, it kind of has to do with perfect brackets or not, is um, I don't recall, I believe it was a for Florida Atlantic coach after their Sweet 16 win. I think it was him. I can't recall 100%. Um, he was interviewed and uh, he was asked about the team and how he was able to, you know, uh, get the team to believe that they were, you know, able to, going to be able to win their games and get get as far as they initially did. And this was before um, the actual, um, before they made the final four. And something that I thought was really interesting, and it was kind of a similar tone and um, narrative from all the other coaches as well. Miami, Florida coach, UConn, and San Diego State, is that the coaches shared that they were able to bring their teams together because they believed in themselves and they believed in each other. And uh, there, there wasn't more as more of a follow-up. Like, I would have asked a couple more follow-up questions about that. Basically, each interview, if you watched them back on uh, YouTube, uh, they talked about... Uh, a belief in one another, a belief in their team, a belief in their culture, a belief in what um, their focus was and unselfishness and all these different things, right? And it got me thinking that four teams that were probably the most, I mean, I guess unlikely combination, or one of the most unlikely combinations of final four teams, um, made it that far by beating all these other teams that have maybe more prominent coaches, prominent players, uh, facilities back home, all these different things, right? Everything that I've talked about in the past about, you know, if you build it, they will come. And, uh, you know, if you have a great coach and maybe great athletes, maybe you have uh, a leg up um, on your competition. But I, I find a lot of similarities with what the coaches shared and what Judd had shared many times in other podcasts and in just my personal conversations about, um, you know, a good coach believed in will always beat a great coach whose athletes don't believe in them. And this isn't to say that the top teams or the higher ranked teams or the bigger number like or the smaller number rather like my uh, five-year-old says um, doesn't mean the coaching is poor it doesn't mean that um, the athletes don't believe in the system but something happened over the course of the elite eight where your your two arguably the two best teams left right Houston and Alabama like just basically top of uh, and then you learn more about the background of the other coaches. And I and I knew that the coach from Miami 
had coached the team in the final four before. So it wasn't like his first go round or anything like that. But the way the, the coach or the athletes kind of like interacted with each other, and you could just tell at least the Miami Hurricanes last night um, that, uh, um, you know, they were bought in and things. But it's just interesting seeing that play out in other sports and other contexts because you don't really see that too often. One might assume that uh, the better coach on paper, however you define that, uh, is going to always prevail. Uh, and, you know, it's not always the case. We, it was clearly evident this weekend that it was not the case. But then why wasn't it the case? And I'm trying to figure that out. And I'm not really sure. I kind of have a theory about sports performance at that level. Uh, but not, not uh, developed enough or far, far more developed than I'd like to share. But I think there is something to it that um, if you get a team on a roll late in the season and they believed in, in themselves and they believed that they could, you know, essentially conquer these, uh, the better teams on paper, um, that there's really, you know, there's a good chance that they're going to, going to be able to do that. Um, and you see it with other sports all the time too. You see it with, uh, you see it in football, you see it in baseball, you see it in basketball, where it's not always the team. Not always. There's always that sometimes, right? But it's not always the team with the best um, athletes that are going to prevail. That sometimes there is a little bit to um, unselfishness. There's a little bit to, uh, you know, am I really bought in enough that... I'm more excited about team success than individual success. Um, and that might be difficult to come by, right? Like you don't know what things are gonna look like until you bring all the athletes together. It's kind of like, I don't know, I guess building a classroom, right? Or class groupings um, for teachers, right? You try and ascertain as much information as you can about the students. And you try and gather as much information as you can from families, from parents. And, um, you know, based on student abilities and all these different things, you try and create the best matchup or the best pairing um, for the student and the teacher so they're successful. Um, but as I've learned from this year, uh, someone I think seems like they just took darts and just threw them at a board and just created class, class groupings. And, if this person ever listens to this podcast, uh, I'll be surprised. But um, there is something to that, and we found out. Well, I found out the hard way this year um, about how that uh, that's actually going. So, when constructing teams, and this is, I guess, I guess I'll, I'll share a little bit of this. Coaches might take that into consideration, right? They're trying to figure out which combination of players and, and the type of personalities are going to fit our program best, right? It's not like Miami doesn't have the best players or not great players. Um, I mean, Wong is the, uh, is the ACC Player of the Year, so it's not like they're short on talent, um, but it's how that talent manifests itself in competition. Like in a classroom, you have 10 or 15 or 20 individual students, and individually or in groups of two or three, two or three, uh, things seem to you know work out fairly well, right? Uh, but then when you put everybody in a class together, certain personalities come out that may not have been as easy to predict uh, when you first you know created your class groupings that's it about class groupings and coaching just something interesting i'm sure we'll get down to the bottom of this someday but stay tuned and hopefully we'll be able to find out together thank you very much for listening to this episode of the throws doc podcast i'm your doc dr charles inferna and have a great day